Let's go. Okay, so my talk is actually on an algorithm for deciding what type of uh, ECMO we should, uh, what, what type of ECMO you should choose, okay. VV, VA, okay. or whatever iteration of it. So let's go to my next slide. Oh, I hear I have it. Never mind. I'll do it. Yeah, there you go. So here's the patient. Patient is a 26 year old female. Uh, Patrick, mm -hmm. you are barred from answering anything. Okay. So 26 year old female, is 27 weeks gestation, <laughs> severe preeclampsia. The EF is 20% by intraoperative TEE. The SAO2 is 84% on maximum ventilatory support. The patient is in fulminating, fulminating pulmonary edema. There is a plan to do an emergency C-section and go on ECMO pretty much at the same time. How do you want to cannulate this patient and why? Tammy? Pass. <laughs> no, hard, hard, hard photo pass. friend. Hard okay, pass. Mike? VV. VV. Why would you choose VV with an EF of 20%? Uh, that's, uh, to me, that's due to other situations, other that uh, going on ECMO and oxygenating the patient would help take care of. Mm -hmm. I think VV. That's I, your I, thought? Yeah, okay. that's my thought. Miss Kim? I'm thinking VA. I'm going to go against you. You want to go VA? Okay, going go against them. All right, why? Why would you choose VA? The heart failure. The heart failure. Okay, that's good. Bold. Miss Tammy? <laughs> I have to commit. You have to commit. <laughs> <laughs> There's only two. You're, you're, you know. A or B? Yeah. No, you can go VVAA or I'm VVVV. Not doing, I'm not doing that. Okay, so you want VV or VA? I guess I'm going to lean for VV. Okay. Same so this, thoughts. Same as reasons Mike. as Mike? Right. Okay. So when I first heard about this case, I was like, you're doing what? No, you need to go on VA. I was with you on this one. Mm -hmm. But, so what's the, is anybody out there want to, anybody call in? You could win a Perf Web Cup. <laughs> yep. We had one that was up here today that was pretty nasty, but I don't you know who's that one. You get a clean one. one. Yeah, we need to get from the last year. You get a clean one. Clean I didn't one. use it. It wasn't mine. It wasn't me. Okay. I think it was John. It looked like somebody spit in it. It looked it, like they, they were chewing tobacco. No, it looked no. like old coffee. Old coffee. Okay. It was, it was John. pretty nasty with the creamer in it. Okay, yeah. so the answer, the answer. Patrick, what's the answer? VV. VV. Why VV? And Mike hit this on the head. He's absolutely right. So this is a very important algorithm that everyone should have. You can get it from the ELSA Red Book. You can download it online, but you need to have this algorithm with you at all times, whether it be in your head or whether it be on a card. So if you look at the algorithm, if you have, re and we're all not worried about the right side, if you uh, the right side of this thing, just if you have refractory hypoxemia, and a Murray, a Murray lung score of three to four, and you are in either cardiogenic shock or without cardiogenic shock, you have to follow the, the pathway. So let's say it is with cardiogenic shock because she was certainly in it. Then you go down the algorithm, all other heart failure. Well, she doesn't really have any reason to be in heart failure. But is the cardiogenic shock secondary to hypoxemia? And this is where the clinical decision at the time, when they told me they were going to be initiating VV ECMO, I literally was like, no, don't do that. Don't do that. Somebody say something. Nobody said anything. And at the end of the day, you know, Patrick, Nate, mm -hmm. Dr. Matoyer, we're all 100% correct. Mm -hmm. So they put the patient on VV ECMO. And the uh, patient did great and uh, it all went well. And if you look at that algorithm, it's very simple. Hypoxemia, you either have shock or you don't have shock. If you don't, if you do, then is it due to some, uh, you have heart failure for another reason. Right. Yeah. And there was no reason for this young 26 year old to have heart failure. She didn't have history of it. Um, and so the determination was it was due to hypoxia and the patient was put, as you see on the arrow, on VV ECMO, and it was the appropriate thing to do. Um, in the case of all other heart failures, the other side of that is veno-arterial or veno-arterial venous 
ECMO. So you can either do VAV or v just straight VA mm -hmm. and uh, would be appropriate. So VA for the circulatory support, VAV for the circulatory and pulmonary support. So you'd be com combining both. So just very quickly, VV, you know, it's so easy to do. I'll just very quickly going over these slides, not gonna spend much time on it. So that's one methodology, double cannulation, one in the femoral vein, going up to the, inferior, the high inferior cava, one in the right IJ, going to the superior vena cava. You get a whole bunch of res circulation through this, but it does work, you know, effectively if you have any lung capacity at all and i'll tell you this turning the flow up makes it worse turning the flow lower makes it a little bit better sometimes <laughs> so you know when you don't get the result you want turning the flow up doesn't necessarily help it sometimes makes matters worse there's these techniques where you can see the cannulas are being put in at different lengths the access catheter and the return catheter are the same type of catheter once put higher obviously the return taking advantage of the normal flow of the uh, venous circulation back to the heart but you'll still suck some of that blood down and then you can see they're using the uh, typical method that i showed you earlier the femoral jugular configuration this is the crescent it's the competitor to the uh avalon catheter and as you can see it's a little bit longer and the holes are a little farther apart. So you get less recirculation, theoretically. Mm -hmm. We have used it and we have had, I think, good results with it thus far um, on the cases we have used. We used the St. Luke's on the cases there. I can't remember which patient that was. It was this one. Oh, this, on this girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. We used it on this lady. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. So we had switched to the uh, crescent over there. We're trying to convert all the, all of the places to it, but we're slowly getting there because we had to use up our stock of the Avalons. Right. It is as a, uh, as a. Roger had mentioned it is rather expensive. You know, I mean the 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 it's it's less expensive barely than the um, than the Avalon, and that's only because everything comes in it not you don't have to buy separate insertion kits and avalon is kind of weird you buy the cannula so you buy a 27 and a 31 that's going to wear adult that's the sizes we're going to use but you have to buy a uh, insertion kit of five and so your insertion kits get used unevenly and you always end up with more insertion kits than you have of cannulas it just that keeps growing as you're using them mm -hmm. And so it's problematic for us from a from a just from a, a, a business perspective. Uh, this comes all inclusive. It has the insertion kit and the cannula all together. So it's just a little more affordable, um, but it seems to be a really nice catheter. It works really well, and it has a real interesting shape to it, which makes insertion much easier than what you find with the Avalon catheter. Uh, they come in similar sizes mm -hmm. and uh, flow rates and all of that kind of thing, but a little lesser circulation because the, 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 it is a little longer and the holes are a little farther apart. Um, this is what he was talking about, which is the Tandem Heart Protect Duo, and this is actually designed for RV failure, but you can use it as a uh, VV ECMO to significantly reduce recirculation because it goes through the IJ and then you're drawing from the right atrium and the tip resides in the main trunk of the pulmonary artery. Mm -hmm. So you can see that you would have much less recirculation this way, but it's actually designed as an RV support device yeah. that uh, just happens to have this other, you know, advantage. And so, uh, but his point was, it's kind of rough on the valves. It's a big catheter and it's not easy to put in. Uh, and it's very expensive. So the, the 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 Avalon and the Crescent are, you know, about twenty five hundred for each catheter. This catheter here is about eighteen thousand. Um, so it's a very expensive catheter because they won't sell the catheter only. You have to buy the whole kit, uh, which is the uh, pump piece of it and all that stuff. Uh, except in Canada, they do sell it separately, and in Canada, they sell it for between ten and eleven thousand for each catheter. So wow. they use it a lot for their ECMOs. There, uh, my buddy up in uh, New England—I mean, not in New England, in uh, Newfoundland—he uses them uh, regularly, and he really likes them. He says they work really well. Okay, so patient two. Now this is going to be a real tough one. But uh, this comes with a prize too. Patient two is a 19-year-old male. He's five foot ten, recently traveled to the United States from Africa. He is we were concerned I was concerned about Ebola. 
Um, he was uh, unable to ventilate or oxygenate at all. He had very high peak pressures. I mean, his peak pressures on the lowest tidal volumes we could give this kid were, you know, bordering on 45. I mean, it was really, really, really bad. And uh, his, white, his white blood cell count was under 5,000. He was in septic shock, uh, multiple pressors for blood pressure. His LV, however, was just hyperdynamic. And uh, VA ECMO was done with two peripheral cannulas, femoral, femoral, both of which were, I'll add, undersized for this patient, uh, I think it was a uh, an 18 French uh, VFEM catheter and a 16 French Opti catheter in the uh, femoral artery for return. Flow was four liters with very high line. I mean, the, I, we didn't measure the line pressure, but the line was tight. The line pressures were high. The patient continued to do poorly, had severe refractory lactic acidosis. Arterial BP, however, was 120 over 90 on ECMO with continued max pressure support. The arterial PO2 was 300. The oxygenator was 350, but the pulse ox on, was not reading on multiple sites, neither hand, neither ear, nor the temporal uh, area. Now, what's wrong, Patrick? He's got an aneurysm. Huh? He's got an aneurysm coming off the arch somewhere. Maybe. Okay, that's your that's, that's your answer, guess. and yeah. you stick it to it. I'm sticking to it. Okay, Mike. <laughs> mm, this, this is a good one. Um, the best answer, I mean. Doing poorly. I think uh, I'm, I'm going to go back to something you said earlier. I think this guy would benefit from a different size cannulas. Oh, clearly. Mm -hmm. You know, clearly. I, I, that would be my first thing I would do, but I'm not quite sure why he's doing as bad as he's doing. Clearly, yes. Okay. Yeah. Miss Kim. No idea. <laughs> okay. Ms. Spirocino? Well, I'm really puzzled because his PO2 is really high. Yes, it is. I'm puzzled too. Hmm. So let me just ask the question this way. Where was that PO2 drawn from? Oh, okay. Right. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah. Patrick? I guess I'm going to guess the circuit. No, Probably. it wasn't a circuit. It was an APO2. Okay. From our arterial sheath. Well, okay. So going back to my thought, I mean, they probably got from, you know, from a, a radio. Yeah. Nope. It no? was drawn from, this is where the problem comes in. Oh. It was drawn from, that was the question I was but waiting for everybody to ask me. But if he did have an aneurysm, then yeah. if they did draw yeah. from the radio, you know, yeah. it could have been right. But right. this was drawn <laughs> from, from the... Contralateral femoral artery mm -hmm. from where the cannula, return cannula was. Mm -hmm. So how accurate do you think that APO2 was? Yeah. That was essentially a circuit gas. Yes, it's a circuit gas yeah, from the patient. From the patient. Because you're basically right out of the cannula. Right out of the cannula. Exactly. Right you knew it? He knew it. <laughs> you win the cup. <laughs> Clean one. So, Real quickly, you know, we all know what the circulatory system looks like. The real problem here happened to be this Harlequin syndrome. So we all know what it is. Your hyperdynamic LV lungs were absolutely not working at all. Patient's lungs were gone. So there was no oxygenating this patient with their lungs. You had zero uh, contribution from them. So we have these teeny little cannulas in the femoral artery flowing up with an LV that's just being, this kid's native cardiac output, I'll bet you was 16 liters. And his pressures were so high. As, mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So his we were perfusing from probably infra-abdominal mm -hmm. to his legs are very nicely. Lovely, mm -hmm. beautiful. And that's why that gas, arterial gas, looks, the PO2 looks so good. The acidosis was horrible, mm -hmm. but the PO2 was great. So finally convinced them to draw a blood gas from the right radial. And that's why the pulse sauce wasn't working because it was so low. Right. And the PO2 was 26. Mm -hmm. 
coming out of the right radial. Well, we know the outcome was poor. I do remember this yeah. patient. You remember this patient? I remember this patient, mm -hmm. yes. So what could we have done otherwise? Well, there was clearly a thought that the patient needed circulatory support. And I can understand that. Despite having a hyperdynamic heart, they had that patient on massive amounts of pressors. Massive. To get a hundred pressure, pressure of 120, I mean, it was massive. There was, they were in, they were in just septic shock, complete cardiovascular, or at least vascular collapse, vasoplegia. Their heart was still beating really well, but they were 19 years old. You expect right. that. That's mm -hmm. the dilemma right there. But you could have done VVA. That would have been a good choice. Mm -hmm. You get the circulatory support, plus you get the oxygenation on the right side. Wouldn't have been perfect, but it would have been good, better than what we were doing. We could have cannulated the subclavian artery. We could have done, we could have done VVA. We could have tried that. Tattoo venous drainage and one arterial would have given us a little more flow, but you need bigger cannulas to do that. I mean, there's a variety of things we could have done. We could have done VVAV. We could have put two circuits in and done VV and VA. Mm -hmm. We could have done anything other than what we did. Did we also uh, consider uh, central cannulation on this guy? Um, no, they didn't. Ne no, they never considered central cannulation, but they eventually decided to take him to the operating room and try to convert him to VV. Mm -hmm. Right. But right. We were not, that's not part of this lecture. Right. That's part of my nightmares. So, <laughs> so we don't lecture about my nightmares. Fortunately, I skipped that part. I, I, know, I remember that. that, that part yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, you know, I've said it so many times, you know, that VA ECMO with peripheral cannulation for isolated pulmonary failure is absolutely, it's useless. It, it, it's, it's, I don't know how else to say it. It's idiocy. It's, it's useless. Absolutely. Now, VAV, you know, look, you got, well, I want the circulatory support. I don't, I don't think he's going to get better just with oxygenation. We need circulatory support. Right. Fine. Right. Do VV, VA or VAV or do, you've got to do something to, to recognize that if you're going to peripherally cannulate this patient, you have to do something to oxygenate because that syndrome of north-south, harlequin, dual yeah. circulation, whatever you want to call it, is very real. And you also have to be able to know your circuit and understand the just basic anatomy mm -hmm. that I'm drawing the blood gas from the contralateral femoral artery where this cannula is flowing four liters in. Right and my PO2 is 350, and you're like, look, it's fine. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Mm -hmm. You've got to draw it from the right radial. Right. Mm -hmm. That's your most, that's the most distal point from the, from, the, from the heart that's feeding the head. So if your right radial, mm -hmm. whatever that is, that is what's in your brain. That, that's, mm -hmm. that's the true measurement. That's the true measurement, yeah. exactly. So, just one of those lessons. My lecture is kind of like, eh, think about it. Okay, don't be this guy. I just said it. Never use VA ECMO with peripheral cannulation, fem fem, for, for pure pulmonary failure when there is no LV dysfunction. But if there is LV dysfunction, I need to add to that slide, do something for the LV dysfunction, but don't just depend on peripheral fem fem VA ECMO for pulmonary failure. Right. If that's a problem, regardless of whether you have also LV dysfunction, you've got to treat both separately in some way. You can do it in combination, but you've got to treat both problems, not just one thinking you'll treat both. It's kind of the opposite of the case you did that won you the crystal heart, mm -hmm. which was a yeah. big honor, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and we're proud of you for that. But in that case, single VV ECMO was the right thing to do. Because I mean, I, my first thought was, no, you need VA because you need the circulatory support. But you really didn't because mm -hmm. her LV dysfunction was because of her hypoxia. Mm -hmm. Whereas in this case, your LV is young and it's just beating, his heart's beating like crazy. Mm -hmm. And his problem, although that was a problem, but the oxygenation problem compounded it, it, con and, it, and, it and it complicated matters that you have to treat both of them or you're, you're going to be, you're going to fail, right? 
So now another problem you get with peripheral VA cannulation is this. You can see that the intraventricular septum is severely displaced mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. to the uh, left side. This is what it looks like when you put an impella in, which is now gonna decompress the LV, mm -hmm. and you can see the impella coming in through the valve up there. Uh, let's see, right over there, right there, coming in, right down there. Mm -hmm. So that's decompressing the LV, and you see how the intraventricular septum has come back over to the midline where it needs to be. So that's always good. You gotta worry about clot, you gotta worry about clotting off your LV. That's a problem too. So, but anyway, that's 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 the idea there. But there are other ways to to, to deal with this. Um, here's a really good talk, I think, or a good slide. VA ECMO with peripheral cannulation and LV wall stress. You can see with the uh, line right here that as you're on VA ECMO and you increase your flow, you see LV wall stress uh, going up significantly when you put either in the tandem heart or you put the Impella 5.0, you can see LV wall stress comes way down. So this is basically a, an empty decompressed LV, but if you don't have that and you have LV, just you, you, your LV is not pumping, you're gonna have some level of, uh, of aortic insufficiency and filling on the left side that's just gonna keep filling that heart until it gets very distended. And of course, when it gets distended, LV wall stress is high, you know you don't get very good coronary circulation. So now you're taking a heart that's sick and you wanna recover it and you have it on VA ECMO and it's just getting sicker and sicker and sicker. It's not, we're not, we're helping the brain and the body, but we're really not doing much to really recover the heart. We're hurting them at that point. So you got to fix it, but you can do it different ways. You don't have to use an impella, though the impella I think is a good option as an LV vent. And in some cases, it's a good option, I think, for just circulatory support on its own merit. Though I think it's somewhat tricky. It's extremely expensive. It's kind of finicky in positioning. And uh, I'm not sure if it's really a good long-term option. I'm just not really sure. So now you can win a prize. Somebody here can win a prize, okay? Take a look at this picture. And I'm gonna just go through it with you, okay? Because I wanna be fair. Everyone knows what blue means, right? Blue means Venus. So this is an access line that's coming down like this. And there's another access line right here. So this line and this line are wide together going to the inlet of the pump down there somewhere. And then the return is this line going into that femoral artery and this line going into that femoral artery. So it's a it's a multi-part it's a multi-part question, multi-part test, all right? Somebody's going to win this prize and I want to give it to you. I really do. But it's a super secret. It's not a cup. <laughs> it's a real prize. This is a super secret prize, but it's a real prize. Anybody wants to call in, call in if you think you can answer these questions, all right? I mean, we're going to we want to be fair to everybody. The question I have is, what do you notice odd about this line in particular? And I'll just give you I'll make it easy for. I'll give you a hint. That line right there. What do you notice that's strange about this line coming into and mixing with this line? It looks it's arterial. Oxygenated. Yeah, there's it looks arterial. VA, yeah. and then the, you get an mm. artery and a mm. vein but, okay. mixing together. So where is, that's very good, excellent. So now the next question is, where is this line? This is in the femoral artery. That is in the femoral artery. This is in a femoral vein, and I'm giving you all the clues. There you go. So, I mean, I'm not even trying to hide anything from you. Where is it? No, oh, it's not in the air. Crickets. Dare. Dare. dare? <laughs> what does that mean? Dare. Which which Dare. one are we answering? Uh, the, this line. The right left here. leg or the right leg? This one right here. Okay. See my arrow? Where is that going out where of? It's is, out. No, where is it pulling? Where it's a Venus. Is, it is it? Where no, it's is not. it? It looks arterial. Yeah, but it is Venus. Okay. It's recirculation happening. Okay. But mm -hmm. why? Uh, oh, so you gave the answer. So right. you think it's that. Okay. Is that your answer? Yeah. Okay. No prize for you. <sighs> Who else? <laughs> Anybody? Come on. 
You got to get this. I, I, well, I don't. I don't have a good answer. I love I've got, this I've got slide. An answer, but it's not a good answer. Well, what is it? Here's, this is V A A A ECMO. <laughs> no, I just told Never you. Never heard of it before. I just told you it's in a vein. I even told you the thing's yeah, in a vein. She it said recirculation. And what do you it think? Doesn't look like Mike? recirculation. It, it, it definitely is in the vein, but. I think what we're seeing there oh, is. Here, you want the, uh, the, the, no, the, no. the thing, the arrow? One of them, one of them is, is the cannula that goes all the way up to the top. The other is in the, in the small femoral. OK, so you think these are both in femoral arteries? No, I think one's in femoral artery, one's femoral vein. But I think what they. Uh, so you think this one isn't in as far as. It's advanced as, I think too that far. That one is advanced it's, way up to the top, to the yeah, heart. It's advanced This too one's far. advanced all the way up to the heart. Yeah. OK. I think. OK, you had a different idea. No price for you either. <laughs> oh, man, last chance. Ah, last chance. All right, come on. You got to get this. Somebody. It's Katie. Oh. Come on. <laughs> oh. Uh, I don't know. Somebody can win a prize. You want to call it in? It's a tough question. It's a tough question. <laughs> is a tough it is. Question. It's a tough one. Hmm. I told you it was advanced too far. Well, I, I know it was up too far, but That's I didn't it. know it went through, <laughs> through that. Really so, it went through. so instead of using an impella okay. to decompress the left <laughs> side, you put a line up through the vein, go transeptal from the right atrium to the left mm -hmm. atrium, and now you can decompress the left side. Do people do that? Yes, people do. <laughs> you see the drawing, don't how do they, you? How do they make the hole in the atrium? You do a septostomy. You use a needle or you use, uh, mm -hmm. there's another device out there. Huh? Percutaneously? Yeah, you puncture a needle wow. through it. Okay. Yeah, All right. percutaneously. And there's a, uh, there's a device that uses um, RF, radio frequency waves, to actually cut through. So a lot of times when they do these needle punctures, because transeptal, you know, transeptal approaches for things is common. Mm -hmm. yeah. They do it all the time in the EP lab. But when they use a needle and push through, sometimes it will tear the septum. You'll get a you'll get a tear. It's hard to close that then percutaneously or with like a, 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 a atrial sept an atrial uh, septal defect closure device. Yeah. And um, so they use this other device, and I can't remember who makes it now, but it goes up, and they use RF waves, and they puncture through with that and then they're able to go in and dilate it and put a catheter through. Mm -hmm. And then you hook the catheter up to your venous and you have a left atrial mm -hmm. drain, so you decompress the left side while you're on ECMO. We had no that. chance of winning any Four man's in Pella. That's right, that that's, about, <laughs> that's about a $60, $100, $120 device yeah. versus yeah, really? a oh, wow. or $28 yeah. or $35,000 mm -hmm. device. Right. So you gotta think about that. And of course, we all know what the cold foot looks like, and that's we saw the side port on that right there, you know, sitting there right here, and mm -hmm. then going into the SFA and you know feeding the foot. So cold foot, and, and then you can make it a little look a little bit little bit better. So there's some of our resources that I'd like to see you take advantage of that we have. Of course, Nurse Web is coming up pretty soon. Um, we're also going to have ECMO training. Um, and uh, for ECMO specialists with nurse ECMO specialists, respiratory therapy ECMO specialists, um, perfusionists who may want to also attend this class. It's going to be uh, approved for category one CEU, CNE, and also uh, whatever I guess the iteration is for uh, respiratory. You want to talk about that a little bit? Talk about our ECMO course and kind of where we are did. with that? Well, you can <laughs> elaborate on it. <laughs> Um, so you're the education director. Yes, so you're director I'm the education, of education. I'm director yeah. of education. So we are developing um, a course that goes through all of the curriculum recommended by ELSO. Um, and so we're looking forward to 
starting mm-hmm. up and getting rolling. So we're going to get it. The CNE is going to be coming from TNA. Is that right? Yes, from the Texas Nurses Association. Very good. So yep. be looking for it online. We'll yep. send some notifications yep. out and that kind of thing. Mike, you're going to be yes. one of our instructors. Absolutely. Patrick, I think you want to. You yep. signed up to also be a Tammy. Yep. I signed you up to be one of our instructors. <laughs> Thank of course, you, guys. <laughs> Katie's, I am too. She yep. signed me up too. Katie, yeah, of course, is I the did. director and she gives some lectures. Yep. So uh, that and with that, thank you. And any questions? <laughs> So uh, we could just go to questions and see if anybody has any questions for me on my talk. It's just amazing how many different ways you can hook things up. <laughs> and I think yeah, that's true. It really, is. I mean, there's a lot of different accesses, and and uh, you just got to find the one that that really works the best to provide what you need. Yeah. And the thing about it is, uh, there's been uh, quite a few times that uh, we've done. VA to start with, but as the heart comes back, we realize now VV is the more appropriate and mm-hmm. you make those switches based upon what your patient needs. Right. And because uh, for one part of it, it serves its function, provides the care it needed at that point. Now you're on, as you mentioned earlier, you're now on to something else. Mm-hmm. You've got to treat what the patient needs. Correct. And so get their the appropriate circuit for the appropriate patient requirement. Well, I think that goes back to really understanding what you are providing. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't understand what you're providing and what the patient right. needs you to provide, you can end up doing more harm than good. As Clearly. You know. yeah. Yeah. Clearly. I think that's it. I think that really understanding the circuit. Mm-hmm. You know, look, mm-hmm. I mean, we're perfusionists, right? But, I mean, I know guys, you know, I think you do too, who are great. I mean, they're really good perfusionists. They've been around for a long time. But they really don't understand ECMO because they never did. They didn't do it. But they do some great perfusion cases. They're really good perfusionists. Mm -hmm. But ECMO is such a different thing. Mm -hmm. And you really have to understand what the circuit's doing. Right. You know, it's not like central cannulation, heart, lung machine, on bypass. You know, we got that. It's a little different when you got these cannulas stuck in these different Mm -hmm. places. And what are they really doing? Right. Right. Well, and I think it is more a big picture too for the people caring for the patient in the ICU. It's not mm-hmm. just perfusionists, you really need to understand it. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of hospitals are offering <coughs> ECMO now because it's the thing to do and it's gonna be easy, but if you don't have intensivist and, you know, a hematologist and infection control and all these different people. Cardiology, pulmonology. Right. But I think too, you know, and, and, and we may be getting off topic, I hope you don't mind, but the thing is, it. You need a team. Mm-hmm. You got to have a team. An and ECMO the team has to team. be cohesive, right. number one. And number two, you have to have a physician, so somebody who has clout, mm-hmm. some power that can say, this is what I want, who is the director of the program. Yeah. That, you know, the pulmonologist, the intensivist, can the cardiologist, whomever it is, can manage the patient, and it could be one of those people, is the medical director of the ECMO program at any hospital, mm-hmm. and they have, they should have absolute power to be able to say, got to stop. This is not, mm-hmm. this yeah. is no yeah. longer the right thing to do, mm-hmm. and we got to call the family and that's it. Because too many, too many times that happens where it languishes and goes on and on and on, mm-hmm. and you're torturing people. But then on the other hand, there's people who don't want to put the patient on ECMO, and they're getting referred for it. And this person, based on their experience and understanding of ECMO, is saying, what are you waiting for? Put the patient on ECMO. Mm-hmm. You have, and how is the protocol going to be done? Look, we treat it with, we treat with albumin. This is what we do. This is our protocol. Because mm-hmm. you get this new physician comes in. Oh, no, albumin's really bad. And we know it's not. And then we have to go through that whole process again of having a difficult run with no volume, watching the patient blow up like a like Jabba the Hutt. And you're just, you know, or Michelin Man or whomever, whatever. And you're frustrated because now you've got somebody else wanting to do it their way. You have to have a system and a protocol and people need to follow it yeah. if you want to have a successful program mm-hmm. yeah. not just a bunch of sesame street kids and everybody does things their own way right depending on work. who's on shift right right and then you had that problem shift right. changes and weekends and whatever it may mm-hmm. be so you need you need to have a, a strong you have to have a strong leader you, that, have, I really str- believe you have, that. have to have a structured committee with someone in charge yes. who is able to make those decisions yes. 
and who also this team needs to come together and write protocols that are followed as a standard. Yes. And, and of course, then when you get curveball patients, right. you're like, well, well, you know, in this case, you know, but let's discuss that. Let's right. just, mm -hmm. you know, this is not a, uh, uh, this is not a dictatorship with new dictators every 12 hours. Right. 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 Therein right. lies the problem. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. So every time the, 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 the new dictator shows up, they want it their way. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. not what they were, what we were doing. And there's no continuity, I guess, would well, be the and word you that we're looking for. No one feels responsible, too, if you're in a situation where the patient is not improving, is not going to improve. No one wants the responsibility of saying this is the end because there's no structure to who's supposed to make those decisions. Right, mm -hmm. right. Or this patient needs to get shipped out. Right. To start the process. Mm -hmm. right. What does this patient, this patient is going to need a transplant. This patient is going to need a long-term device. This heart will never come back. Mm -hmm. right. This we can only provide this patient this much. If it's, this is just a waiting game, we have everything this patient needs, mm -hmm. and we can mm -hmm. treat this patient effectively, keep the patient. Right. But when right. you don't have the services right. 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 to give them what they need, stabilize them, and get them someplace else. That's the most right. frustrating is because you've now decided to keep a patient maybe long term or maybe just a few days because you haven't figured out that they need to go ahead and transfer, and now you've really hurt that patient's chances of recovering mm -hmm. at a center that could have helped Potentially, them. Potentially, yeah. by waiting, by delaying. By delaying. Right, by delaying. Mm -hmm. But So you have to you have to be able to get those, you know, what's the game plan? What is the, what's the, what is the, what do you call it? You call it the, what is it called? The, the, the treatment plan. Treatment plan, okay. Yeah. <laughs> what's the treatment plan for this? But you're, you know, you're the nurse here. So, you know, yeah. I don't, I mean, I'm trying to, sure. I'm sure. trying He's to learn more nurse. nurse language. Oh, oh. Huh? You were speaking nurse. I was trying to speak. Yes. Yeah. Speaking. Nurse. Yeah. I'm doing one of those. I'm doing one of those. What's that? What's that called? Babel. I'm doing Babel. Nurse. Nurse. That Babel is a language. Babel. Nurse. nurse. Well, doing that thing. You know, where you can learn Spanish or it used to be called something else. What's that thing? Even Google has it now. The Google Translator. You can pick English to nurse. <laughs> Duolingo. I'm going to have to yeah. look yeah. that. Yeah. It is there. It's there. It's on the Googles. Yeah. Yeah. On the Googles. Google. On the Googles. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I, I, well, I can't wait. think of anything else. I think that that last question with the transeptal, you know, uh, cannula mm -hmm. was unfair. <laughs> we had no chance. File the protest. <laughs> I do want to know something about that. Why was there a distal perfusion catheter and only one leg, not the other? In that patient? In that patient. Like, because don't they put them in when they initially insert the cannulas? Or, yes. No, they actually had two. They had two arterial cannulas. Mm -hmm. So that right. patient was on veno, v left atrial, arterial, arterial. Mm -hmm. Yes. She's saying, why but do why you have to recirculate the leg that has the we vent and the arterial access? Right. The left oh, leg the had. Oh, leg wasn't cold. Yeah. Might have been bigger vessels mm -hmm. put up higher, uh, you know. If the toes ain't black and it ain't cold, you're not going to put that SFA line in unless you have to. But do they not put that in? On some, an, an some places do. Some places do like, it as a standard of care in the right. beginning. Yeah, okay. yeah. It some just, do. Yeah. But usually they just wait to see it's if the like, foot's going to be cold. It's like, why put it in one side and not the other? Yeah. No pulses on one side and pulses, pulses on, on the other. other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, you know, or, or flow by Doppler or whatever, the foot's warm, this foot's mm -hmm. cold. Yeah, I've seen it where both of them have the mm -hmm. SFA line, the distal perfusion catheter mm -hmm. in. I've seen it that way too, but I've seen it where there's been none. I've seen it where there's been one, one side or the yeah. other or both. I as mean, far as vasculature is concerned, symmetry is not a absolute term. That's true, mm -hmm. that's absolutely okay. true. One, right, one femoral iliac system might be you know, so five, better. six millimeters bigger than so uh, better, another one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's possible. Okay, well, I think we had a really good time.